And the work's actually Giselle's PhD thesis, and she apologizes she can't be here. So if you like what I say, give her the credit. If you want to object, then talk to me. Uh, anyway, uh, we, the, we're talking about a property that belongs to Nexon. They were very kind to us. They gave us samples. They gave us some money. And we want to acknowledge their help. And essentially, I want to give an overview of the Horned River Basin, talk about how we collected samples, what we actually analyzed, and sort of what the big inference is. And I think the, the big inference basically is as opposed to the as opposed to the fancy micrographs and so on that are on small scale, I'm talking about big scale, big, big overview and long-term effects. So the Horn River Basin is actually a very large uh, play. It's not being developed until there's more pipeline capacity. Uh, but essentially it's a Devonian play and there's three formations that I want to talk about. And we're going to talk about them individually. And uh, it's a typical, you know, sh over mature shale. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the, these sort of shale plays, when they drill these horizontal wells, they don't radiate like in a star. They, they basically run parallel. And I'm going to be talking about comparing wells that are from the same well pad or adjacent well pad. And I'm going to be comparing production and so on from one of these legs to another leg and so on. So we're talking about a very dense sampling, uh, essentially, of the gases. Uh, and we're going to be talking about production gases and something called mud gases. And again, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, there, there is a technology available to actually collect natural gas while you're drilling. And, at, and you can identify what depth the gas came from, and we can analyze it for the various isotope ratios. And then, of course, you can go after you've done it, after you've done the fracking, you can collect samples uh, for, from the production. Okay, so basically, you know, this lays out what I'm going to be talking about, the different profiles uh, and so on. So let's just dig into it. And to me, this was a huge surprise. Uh, we're, we're talking now about the lateral length of two, two formations, the Musqua and the Otter Park, and we're looking at methane isotope values, ethane isotope values, and propane isotope values, as well as here, it's basically the industry way of recording the amount of gas in the mud, you know, in the mud gas, you know, the amount of hydrocarbon gas in the mud gas. And what we see is that even though these, forma these are two separate formations, but they're only separated by a few meters. I mean, you know, I mean they're, you know, one formation's on top of the other one, yet we see that there's a huge difference in, in their overall behavior. And essentially, the, 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 the Musqua, is very uniform along a, almost a, or more than a kilometer lateral length, whereas the Otter Park is, is quite variable uh, in both isotope ratios as well as, uh, as well as the gas content. And it basically tells you, this is before fracking, it tells you that, the re, at least in my interpretation, is, is that the reservoir is, it, you know, one, one of the formations, the, end of the reservoir is fairly uniform. Maybe the gases have had a chance to mix. Whereas in the other reservoir, or the other formation, the, the, the gases have been compartmentalized. And this is not surprising when you look at the mineralogy from that same core. I mean, I mean, this is from drill cuttings from that same well. And we see that the Otter Park, which we saw, had the big isotope and composition variation along the lateral length, also has mineralogical variations, whereas the one that was smooth uh, has has, uh, you know, the uniform mineralogy. Okay, so looking at the isotope ratios, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the way we do things, one of the effective ways of describing a natural gas is by looking at the isotope ratio of the component versus one over its, uh, its number of carbon atoms. So methane is here, ethane and propane. And if in the perfect world, they should align in a straight line, and they should intersect the source rock, and it should, uh, but we see that the methanes just don't fit. Uh, she, uh, Giselle called these things normal because they project into the, uh, what we expected as the Kerrigan Valley, uh, but, and, and they don't show isotopic reversals, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, okay, so here, before I get into that, let's look at the time series. Uh, again, the three formations, the Musqua and the Otter Park, 
have basically the same composition. They're about 80, or, or nine, you know, 90% methane, about 10% uh, 10 CO2. The EV has more CO2. Um, but we can see then that these are uh, samples from the same well sampled over several days or even several months. Uh, this is a log uh, uh, scale. No, it's not. this one isn't a log scale. And we can see actually there are chemical variations with time. Um, and so, again, it's, to me it was curious. I thought everything would be, you know, once you fract it, once you start producing, I was expecting a lot more uniform behavior. Well, here we have the isotope ratio. In this case, we're looking at the uh, methane, yeah, the isotope ratio of methane, and this is now log time. Uh, we don't have samples from the same well from the beginning to the end. Uh, so, so we have two samples, that, two wells where we collected for the first 20 or 30 days, and then we have six wells where we have collections that go out to 50, you know, over 1,000 days. And, and again, what we see is that it's fairly uniform at the beginning, but then in the late stages of production, you're getting huge variations. And, and if you do reading in the stable isotope literature, it is incredible that the same, what you might say, the same source of gas would vary by eight per mil almost, uh, you know, our extreme differences. So this is very unusual behavior. Uh, again, in the shale gas world, one of the big things that everyone talks about is these isotopic reversals. Uh, and in the typical shales, like the Barnett shale and so on and so forth, they're characterized by the fact that the ethane has an unusually low C13 compared to the methane. And, and that's considered a norm, I mean, it's a very, very unusual property in natural gas, but it's normal in practically all shale gases around the world. Uh, but here we see that at the beginning, these were not reversed, and then the reversal basically kicks in quite late in the, in the production cycle. Uh, so what about, uh, we saw an idealized version of this, but these decay curves that was mentioned in a talk, a couple of talks ago. But in the real world, they, they turn on and off the valve. I mean, they turn the valve off and on, either when they're fracking an adjoining well or where there's pipeline issues or there's some mechanical failure, they will shut in the well. Okay, and so, so basically there's definitely that decline in all the wells that we talked about, that the ones we've tested, there's definitely a decline, but it's interrupted by these shut-ins. And after a shut-in, you know, pressure builds up, and then obviously you get a spurt of gas, and then it starts dying down again. Now, if we look at a given well, and if we look at the isotope pressure, so this is the black side here is basically the production, and with the shut-ins, and this is the isotope ratios changes. So what we see is that, okay, so there's some, maybe some systematic change that you can attribute to diffusion and so on, but when you shut in the well, and open the tap again, you get a different gas coming out than what was coming out, you know, when it was coming out before you shut the well in. And we see this repeatedly in a different well, the same thing. So to me, that, again, this is mind boggling. Like why, what in the shut in period causes a different kind of gas to show up at the well bore? Okay, so again, this is basically because we have this wide range of times and so on. This is showing it in the log scale, uh, again, showing that the big, the big effects are late in the system and, and they're, they're dramatic uh, after shut-ins. Uh, okay, so we have these closely related, if spatially and time-wise, uh, related wells, gases, and so we can just basically plot the production that was coming out versus the isotope ratio of methane. Now, if you look, remember some of the earlier slides, it is, I think, diagnostic that the methane values are the ones that are changing a lot, and the ethane and propane, which is in low abundance, only like less than 1%, that, those isotope ratios don't seem to change with time. Uh, now, the, the, the wells were finished differently. The company fracked them differently, they put in different amounts of sand and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is a surprising relationship is that the more productive wells actually have the more negative methane values. Okay, so in conclusion, what does it all say? 
per, from my point of view, it says that shale, the shale gas reservoirs, the shale system, is very, very compartmentalized. There's strange things going on related to hysteresis, especially the, the, you know, when you do the shut-ins and then you start producing again, that I think that during that shut-in period, you made a, maybe created new fractures or maybe did something, but there's a lot to be learned. And I think there's a huge uh, potential for carbonized stop analysis of production cycles to actually help reservoir modelers to figure out what's going on. Uh, indirectly, I think that the basically, if you have a static system, which you record by the mud log before you frack, the, if you have the mineralogical variation, you have the potential of compartmentalizing the shale laterally. So we're actually going through different compartments of shale, uh, which you can't see after you blew it all up by fracking. Say that again. No, I think it's the sedimentology. It's a pre-existing sedimentology in diagenesis. I think what we're seeing, we're seeing such a wide scatter. If it was only absorption, if it was only diffusion, it would always be the same every time, but it's not. So I think it's, it's a combination of, you know, some in some of the sub-reservoir or the sub-compartments, you might have more absorption, less absorption. In other places, you have more diffusion, less diffusion. And when you shut it in, the, the sort of hysteresis will affect different different components differently. I mean, we don't get systematic results. I mean, if you had absorption, you'd be separating methane from ethane. If you had diffusion, you'd be separating C13 from C12. And we do not see it consistently. So I don't think it's a single mechanism. I think it's a, it's a hodgepodge of things going on in a hodgepodge of rock. One quick yeah. question. Could the, the larger variability in the outer park uh, be, do you have an image log? Could that be related to, let's say, bulk flow in natural fractures versus the other locations where you have depleted signatures early on, and that could be matrix stuff? Uh, okay, it's a complicated question. Is no, I don't have an image. We don't have an image analyzer. All we have is the X-ray, XRF. We have the abundance of hydrocarbon. We don't even have the but methane versus ethane ratios or anything like that in the lateral in the lateral leg. I actually disagree with you. I think the diffusion <laughs> in nature isn't the big deal. Uh, but uh, you know, my, my you know my student actually you know says diffusion in there. Uh, so dif there might be diffusion effects, but she's talking about during the production cycle, not the pre-existing. You know, not not in the pre-existing thing. As I interpret it, that if if diffusion was really that effective, it would be uniform. We wouldn't be having it different in different parts of the leg. So since we're seeing differences as you go along the lateral, my interpretation is, is that you're hitting variation, where you're basically looking at compartments, subcompartments, where gases have evolved separately in a you know, slightly different path. 